Live from American University in Washington, D.C., this is The Student Scoop with Nick Wiest and Carly Million. Cool. Good evening. I'm Carly Million. And I'm Nick Wiest. Welcome to The Student Scoop. The AU campus is always buzzing. For our first story today, we get a look at the McKinley Building, the newest addition to the School of Communications that has everybody talking. Ashley Bittenbender has the details. Thanks, Nick. I'm here in front of the McKinley Building, the newest addition to the AU School of Communication, to get the inside story from the head of technology. Let's check it out. The uh, School of Communication was, up until about 18 years ago, a part of the College of Arts and Sciences, the largest uh, group at AU. Um, at that time, 18 years ago, it became an independent school. 18 years ago, the School of Communication branched off from the College of Arts and Sciences and became its own entity, but lacked a central location. Until now, it was spread out among six different locations with only one studio. Although they now have a permanent home and a top-of-the-line studio, the school still makes use of the original studio in the Media Production Center. Specifically, we're in a, a new room here in the McKinley Building. Although originally built in 1906, making it the second oldest building on campus, it is now completely redesigned and digitally equipped. And this is the Media Innovation Lab, the MIL. Um, and it's a multi-purpose room, if you will. It combines aspects of a television studio, uh, aspects of a classroom, aspects of a radio studio, um, and combines them all so that students and faculty can create media in here, everything from traditional television to uh, forms of media we haven't even thought of yet. Well, what's happening here in this building is that it's completely digital. Although it is the smallest of the schools on campus, the School of Communication takes on the big challenge of anticipating future technological shifts. Here we are at the Media Production Center to say goodbye to the old technology and hello to the future of journalism here at AU. Reporting from the Media Production Center, I'm Ashley Bittenbender. Back to you. Thank you, Ashley. It looks like communication students here will be in good hands for many years to come. On the south side of campus, a fairly new program aims to provide crucial support to students who have fallen victim to sexual assault. We now go to Ashley Fowler in the field for more details about how students are prepared to be safe on campus. Today we're here at the American University campus in Washington, D.C. to talk to students about how the dangers of sexual assault impact their lives. First, we asked students when they were warned about the dangers of sexual assault. I was first taught about sexual assault in probably about third grade when we had a lot of assemblies. We were first warned about the dangers of sexual assault in about sixth or seventh grade. We then asked how students were told to avoid sexual assault. In my opinion, women are prepared more, or warned more about sexual assault than men. Um, you know, they're told to wear less provocative clothing, uh, not, you know, to leave their drinks on, keep their drinks covered at parties and that kind of thing. Guys don't really worry about pr protecting themselves. Well, I was always told to stay in groups, so you know, safety in numbers. Never go in a place where you're going to get caught alone. Um, always keep your phone on you. I believe that uh, you should take immediate action when, when there's anything suspicious. I have a uh, sister and um, she like has times where, you know, like she is told to like go back home and fix her outfit. And she's actually um, had moments where like uh, guys actually gone up to her street, like people, random strangers she doesn't know. Finally, we asked students if they felt safe while staying on the American University campus. I feel that American University is very safe. I feel um, very safe, um, very secure from the possibility of sexual assault at American University. I feel perfectly fine walking around by myself or with one or two people. I feel like it's very safe, especially with the uh, various emergency stations strategically placed for um, situations where danger is present. In the short time I've been here, about the two and a half days, all the all the people I've met have been extremely nice and I have never felt uncomfortable in really any situation. We were then able to sit down with Daniel Rappaport, the Sexual Assault Prevention Coordinator, who was able to give us some insight on the dangers of sexual assault for women, as well as ways we can help the problem. I work out of the Wellness Center on campus. I can provide support to anyone who's been directly or indirectly impacted by any form of sexual violence, dating violence, or stalking. Daniel started by giving us shocking statistics on sexual assault. It's a issue and issues that impact everyone. Um, 
with numbers like one in four women experiencing rape or, or attempted rape just during their time in college, one in three women even before uh, they're aged 18 uh, experiencing some form of dating abuse, mm -hmm. and one in nine women experience stalking uh, in their lifetime, which is significant numbers. Daniel gave us some insight into the harmful ways our society is educated about the issue. The way that our culture teaches prevention is teaching women how to try to avoid becoming victims. If we were all in a community pool, and there was a shark in the pool. Clearly, a shark's a big, big theme here. <laughs> a shark was in the pool. That is us as a culture saying, wow, we need to learn how to swim faster, rather than, whoa, there's a, there's a shark in the pool. We need to focus on that shark. And we teach, we try to teach women to swim faster, but that is never, ever going to prevent a crime. It just means a perpetrator is going to move on to someone more vulnerable. So it's not in any way touching actual prevention. That's just an attempt at risk reduction. Telling women to prevent crime from happening is the opposite of true prevention. The issue of sexual assault is far from being solved, but Daniel is working to teach students to change their views on the problem. With education on the issues, we can hope to see sexual assault becoming less and less common. Reporting from American University, I'm Ashley Fowler. Back to you in the studio. Thanks, Ashley. The shark example provided really sheds light on how our culture views sexual assault. As we can see, safety on the American University campus is headed in the right direction with a wide range of tools and support. And now we're going to our correspondents in the field at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. They're going to show you some of the unique traditions of Kenya, the passion of the Kenyan people for dancing, braiding, and much more. Thank you, Carly and Nick. We are here at the Folkland Festival 2014 in the Kenyan section. We are going to show you some of the great culture of Kenya right now, so just watch it. For quite a number of years, something like uh, 30 years. 30 that means I've done it for 30 years. Really? Yeah. Smoke yeah. 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 30 years. Smoke yeah. 30 years. 30 years. Yeah. 30 years. Yeah. Uh, okay, it, it is part of your tradition, right? In Kenya? Mm. It is part of your tradition? Yeah, yeah, it's a part of our tradition, yeah. Yeah, it's a part of our tradition. You have pretty amazing traditions, so. Yeah, like now. And even if we go back in Kenya, we would like to uh, to do in to call us again back to come and perform in America. Uh, we'll be very happy. Okay, thank you. In Kenya, many people practice a certain craft that exemplifies their culture and pastoral art, such as wood carving, basket waving, henna tattoos, and hair braiding. guys learned as much as we did today from the culture of Kenya so thank you for watching back to you Carly and Nick thank you Nona for the wonderful coverage of Kenya at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival it's nice to know that you can experience the spirit and culture of a country without actually going there after venturing for hours around the Smithsonian Folklife Festival one can satisfy their hunger with the delicious and unique taste of Kenyan and Chinese cuisine Naomi Lilly and Christine Luna venture out to find what makes the food of these two cultures one of a kind. Hello, I'm Naomi Lilly. And I'm Christine Luna. Today we travel to the Smithsonian Folklife Festival to explore cuisines from Kenya and China. While talking to the Watu and Company and Collabo LLC, the main focus was how they want to express their culture through their food. Chris, Jennifer, Olive, Adam, and Eric each help inform us on the topic. We're very social culture and social people. Everything is fresh, made every day. Keep it Kenya. After we interviewed Watu and Company, we began to interview people eating the cuisine. This is our first stop and it's spectacular. When asked why Kenyan cuisine was chosen over Chinese, the individual said, Chinese food you can get pretty readily, whereas Kenyan probably would not be able to. After concluding our discussion concerning Kenyan food, we crossed continents in a matter of seconds to explore Chinese cuisine. We talked with Josh Chang, one of the head leaders for Chief Fun Le. He expressed everyone's enjoyment of China's prized noodles. We try to, to bring uh, the noodle to everyone this year. And we try to make very authentic, not the American Chinese, but very Chinese Chinese. Exploring both cultures and cuisines was highly intriguing. We would like to thank the workers for their input and time with us. I'm Naomi Lilly. And I'm Christine Luna. Back to the studio. 
Thank you, Christine and Naomi. The festival looked amazing. It's great to be exposed to different cultures and cuisines. For our last story, NSLC students took a trip to Tenley Town and the Smithsonian Folklife Festival to see what older people know about a younger generation phenomenon. The students discovered just how much of an effect social media has on our lives. Thanks guys. I'm Sean. I'm Katie. And I'm Sophia. And we're here in Tinley Town to figure out just how much people know about social media. Let's go. As of April 24th, 2014, there was 1.2 billion users on Facebook. In fact, if Facebook were a country, it would be the third most populated. Tumblr has a high record of 216.3 million monthly visitors. Instagram has almost 200 million users as of March 25th, 2014. Can you tell me what a selfie is? Sure. A selfie is a picture that someone takes with their Instagram, for Instagram generally, of themselves with their cell phone. It's when you take a picture of yourself. Don't, don't do it. You don't do it? No. Why not? Because I don't have the machine. You take pictures of yourself all day long, one arm, two arm, at different angles. <laughs> do you have a go-to selfie face? Yes. Can you show it to the camera? Do you know what the duck face is also? The duck face. Can I show you? Sure. So basically, it's just where you purse out your lips, and it's mostly for selfies too. It's Not just like, like the fish face. It's like that. A duck face? Yeah. Um, it, it, it does sound like something with American soccer. I think a duck face is somebody that fake. That's fake. That a that a fake. Yeah, it's when you poke your lips out. Do you know what the term "turn up" means? Turn up something like a volume. Turn up. That means you know, just go ballistic when you get to the bar, but not too much. And I'm 97 years old, and uh, I've been in the service. And George Raff, I met a lot of people that were very interesting in life, and I can't understand that. Turn up! Turn up! Can you hit the nay nay for us? Back in American University, I'm Sean. I'm Katie. And I'm Sophia. And although social media is very popular in society today, people don't know as much as we thought. Back to you, Nick and Carly. Social media has played such a large part in our life that 90% of people ages 18 through 29 use social media, whereas only 46% of people ages 65 plus log on every day. Thank you guys for sharing your findings with us. I'm Nick Wiest. And I'm Carly Million. Thank, Thank you, you for, for watching, watching The Student, Student Scoop. Scoop. First things first, I'm the realist. Okay, can we open with that? First things first, I'm the realist. <laughs> Hi, I'm Katie. And I'm Sophia. And now we're at the Miss uh, What is it? <laughs> I'm Katie. And I'm Sophia. And although we... Huh, why are you people walking? Why are you guys leaving? Wait, Ashley, yes. Here at American University, great measures are I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> okay, I, let me just say it one time without being recorded. Okay. Although social media is very popular in society, is that right? Yeah. Although social media is very popular in society, like I can't speak right now. What does the fox say? The fox? The fox. 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 Oh, fox. And although social media is very popular today in society, Oh my god, I oh did it right god. that time too! I'm so proud of myself. Excuse me, sir, you look like you're a very successful cameraman. How, how did that become? I didn't so bother much? people. Very popular today in society. People don't know as much as fuck. Okay, I'm just gonna wing it. Can you see my eyes? Maybe I'll close my eyes. I can just, I reflect through your sunglasses. I reflect through your sunglasses and just keep them there for a second. I'm really sweaty. We're all really sweaty. So what is the most popular dish? Noodle. I think everyone likes noodle. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. You have a good one.